Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this presentation, we will continue our discussion of the nephritic disorders with a focus on Wegener's and Goodpasture syndromes. As with IgA nephropathy and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, these disorders travel together in Step 1 questions. And just a quick word on nomenclature. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis has replaced the eponym Wegener's and will be used throughout this presentation, abbreviated by GPA. As with all recordings, a PDF of this presentation is available at the website. Before launching and to create perspective, here again are the categories for the primary glomerular disorders. I know we reviewed this previously, but you need to develop a categorical approach if you're going to survive step one preparation. So we have the nephrotic syndromes, characterized by massive proteinuria, and the nephritic syndromes, characterized by glomerular bleeding. And for completeness, we do have the overlap syndromes, which may be manifest by either or nephritic or nephrotic components. The nephrotic disorders, as you will recall, include the primary disorders of minimal change, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and membranous nephropathy. They each have distinguishing features, and I've listed a couple, including HIV infection and IV heroin use with focal segmental and immune complex deposition in membranous. The systemic nephrotic disorders include diabetes and amyloid, reviewed elsewhere. And here are the nephritic disorders, including IgA nephropathy versus post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis and GPA versus good pastures, which are the focus of this and the previous video in this series. The overlap syndromes include lupus nephritis and membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, which will be covered in our next recording. So with this broad but important overview, we can proceed. And for those who haven't reviewed the previous recordings, here are the hallmarks or board language of the nephritic disorders, including glomerular bleeding with injury, and that injury is expressed by elevation of the creatinine, hypertension, and mild edema and or proteinuria. When the injury is acute and severe, we call that rapidly progressive or crescentic glomerular nephritis. And with that background, let's proceed. Let's start by highlighting the features that GPA and good pasture share in common. First, you will note they are both classified as a small vessel vasculitis. Check. Further, they both represent prototypic pulmonary renal syndromes, so you can anticipate pulmonary involvement in the majority of the vignettes. In addition, they both have characteristic, albeit unique, serologic markers that will be the target of inquiry or mentioned in the question stems. And finally, although not a requirement, they most often present as the prototypic disorders causing rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Whereas other primary glomerulopathies can present with rapidly progressive, it is GPA and good pastures that are most characteristic. And here is our first key derivatives. What do you need to know about those crescents? You need to know they will be associated with a significant rise in the BUN and creatinine. Obliteration of the urinary space and compression of the glomerular tuft would certainly explain the drop in GFR. You should be familiar with the pathologic description, including parietal cell proliferation with the presence of mononuclear cells and fibrin strands. No matter the cause, crescents are a negative prognosticator for renal recovery from any acute injury. So we know GPA and good pastures are both prototypic pulmonary renal disorders, and each are classified as small vessel vasculitides that result in rapidly progressive or crescentic glomerulonephritis. But how do they differ? That will be the money on the USMLE. During the remainder of this video, we will focus on the unique features of each disorder. So starting with the unique identifiers, GPA will be distinguished by its involvement of the upper respiratory tract. This is huge. If they describe a patient with rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis who also has hemoptysis plus nasal crusting, ulcers, or any other upper tract findings, such as saddle nose deformity, they are telling you the patient does not have good pastures. To be sure, the pulmonary involvement with good pastures is restricted to pulmonary hemorrhage identified by hemoptysis with shortness of breath. Let's underscore these points by looking at the chest radiographs. As you can see, the image on the left demonstrates the nodular appearance characteristic of GPA. The image on the right is a coronal section of a CT from a patient of mine who recently presented with pulmonary hemorrhage. Note the fluffy and diffuse appearance of the infiltrates. The purpose of these images is not to make you expert radiologists, rather to correlate the diseases with their unique identifiers. Looking again at GPA or granulomatosis with polyangiitis, I've inserted the pathologic image of the granulomatosis. 
It is the coalescence of these granulomas that generate that reticulonodular appearance. Coalescence of granulomas and pulmonary nodules. See how that makes clinical sense? Taking this a step further, we mentioned the upper respiratory tract involvement with GPA and not good pastures. Think destructive granulomas. When taken to the extreme, they are described as necrotizing, accounting for the tendency to form the cafeteria lesions associated with GPA. Turning our attention to good pastures, we know that the disorder is characterized by an autoimmune attack against type 4 collagen, which is found in the alveolar and glomerular basement membranes. Given the location in the alveolar basement membrane, it makes sense that the pathologic hallmark includes focal necrosis of the alveolar wall. This is not a granulomatous disorder and would not be associated with nodules or upper tract involvement. This too makes clinical sense. So that little excursion, looking at x-rays and an introduction to the pathology, was meant to underscore the basis of their unique presentations and clinical identifiers. Hemorrhage alone in good pastures versus extra alveolar findings in GPA. We'll come back to these shortly, but let's continue on to pathogenesis. Let's start with the pathogenesis of good pastures as it is well described. We know this is an autoimmune disorder illustrating a classic type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. The target of antibody formation is the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen, a constituent located in basement membranes. In good pastures, the exposed epitope of the non-collagenous domain is found in the alveoli and glomerular basement membrane and is the target of autoimmunity, accounting for the clinical manifestations of the disorder. It is worth noting that type 4 collagen is also found in the skin, eye, and inner ear. And why is this important? Because Alport syndrome is also a disease of type 4 collagen. It too presents with glomerular bleeding and varying degrees of renal failure, visual impairment, and deafness. I won't wander further down this path, but the point is type 4 collagen is found in locations other than the kidney and lung. So let's turn our attention to GPA. I threw the air quotes on pathogenesis as the exact role of C. anca in causing organ destruction is uncertain. Nonetheless, let's review C. anca in this context. And so what do you need to know about C. anca for the boards? First, the neutrophil is the target as in anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. That was easy. You should be familiar with proteinase 3 as the target of antibody formation. Proteinase 3 is simply a neutrophilic protease stored in azurophilic or primary granules. Next, pay attention to the C in C. anca. It describes the cytoplasmic staining pattern seen on immunofluorescence. The cytoplasmic staining is meant to contrast with the perinuclear staining seen in the P. anca vasculitides. These will be further addressed in our vasculitis video, but you should have passing familiarity with P. anca and its antigenic target being myeloperoxidase. You should also be familiar with the disease associations of microscopic polyangiitis and Church-Strauss syndrome, or eosinophilic GPA. So whereas the C. anca describes a immunofluorescence pattern, an abnormal test should be followed by an ELISA titer of proteinase 3. The ELISA assay is an objective measure, whereas the immunofluorescence is a subjective assessment. In fact, the term C. anca, still used in QBanks and NBME, has been replaced by the more accurate description of PR3 anca. That certainly clarifies the antigenic target. Moving on to pathology, we've already reviewed the renal manifestations of crescentic glomerular nephritis. In this regard, the two disorders are similar. The key differences are noted in the pulmonary pathology. Starting with GPA, I spelled out the full name to underscore there are essentially two separate components to the disorder, granulomas primarily involving the respiratory tract and necrotizing vasculitis that affects both the respiratory tract as well as other organs. And when I say other organs, there is not a shortage. To be sure, GPA is a multi-system vasculitis involving organs other than the kidney and lung. I've already emphasized the upper respiratory tract involvement, but you should have vague awareness that other organs, especially the eye, may also be mentioned in question stems. This table lists the entire spectrum of GPA. And although redundant, I will reiterate that good pastures is purely a pulmonary renal syndrome. That is it.
the pulmonary pathology is consistent with the target of injury, that being the alveolar basement membrane. This is described by focal necrosis of the alveolar wall, and that description might include either intraalveolar hemorrhage or the presence of hemosiderin-laden macrophages. And this leads us to the home stretch. How will these patients present? Well, we know they'll both present with similar degrees of renal involvement. GPA will have upper and lower respiratory tract involvement as already mentioned. Good pastures will generally present with signs and symptoms related to pulmonary hemorrhage, including hemoptysis and shortness of breath. But you should be aware that good pastures may present with isolated renal involvement, in which case it is called anti-GBM, glomerulonephritis, or syndrome. And finally, let's make the diagnosis. So we know they will present with glomerular bleeding and an elevated creatinine. Here is the laboratory pattern of one of my patients who presented with rapidly progressive GN. There is nothing subtle about this degree of renal injury. In the presence of pulmonary symptoms, chest radiographs will be obtained. I again emphasize that GPA can present with small cavitary lesions related to necrotizing granulomas. Note the C anca reminds us that these can cavitate. A subtle yet tantalizing piece of data associated with pulmonary hemorrhage is the elevation of the DLCO. It is a stupid and low yield fact, but it does make physiologic sense. The inhaled carbon monoxide used in measuring the diffusing capacity is taken up by the red cells present in the pulmonary hemorrhage. This translates into a higher measured diffusing capacity. DLCO is reviewed in more detail during the COPD video, but you should be aware that the diffusing capacity may rise in pulmonary hemorrhage. Insofar as immunofluorescence, I save the best for last. If and when the patient with acute renal failure comes to biopsy, immunofluorescence will be performed on the biopsy specimen. GPA is described by a posse immune staining pattern. That is, the renal vessels and glomerular basement membrane do not fluoresce. If you think of this as an ANCA-associated vasculitis, it makes sense. Neutrophils and protonase 3 are the targets of injury, not the glomerular basement membrane. So there will be no detection of immune complexes. Posse immune is a term that is not going away. You might as well embrace it now. Compare and contrast that with a linear or ribbon-like immunofluorescent staining pattern that characterizes good pastures. Think about the target here, type 4 collagen. It is distributed throughout the basement membrane, so the staining is uniform and beautiful. Posse immune versus linear. There should be no confusion. Where there is some confusion, however, is in distinguishing the linear pattern from the granular pattern seen in immune complex deposition. Immune complex deposition is seen in several disorders such as membranous and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. In these instances, the pattern is focal or spotty, accounting for the granular appearance. Too often I've seen students misinterpret the granular appearance for good pastures. The NBME expects you to make this distinction. And that is it, my friends. Here's the full damage report. Identifiers, pathogenesis, pathology, presentation, and diagnostics. You have to have this information at the ready come test day. So we've now covered the key nephritic and nephrotic disorders. In subsequent videos, we'll finish up the topic, including a question-based presentation to make sure you grasp the key learning objectives. If you have any questions or concern about any of the material presented in this video, please contact me at 12 days. Thank you.